Okay, let's start. So this is our fourth lecture and we're officially starting our topics on complex integration. And we need to first uh, begin defining the complex riemann stelzius integral in order to define the integral of a function along a path and C, okay? So first, I'll just need some, we need to prove a Cantor's theorem that we're gonna use it in our proof later. So a metric space is complete. A complete means that every Cauchy sequence converges. Okay. Cauchy sequence implies converges. So that means that your this metric space is complete. So Cantor's theorem states that if we're complete, if and only if for any sequence of non-empty nested closed sets. For any sequence of non-empty nested closed sets, and its diameter goes to zero. So if for those who don't know the diameter of the set, it's basically the supremum of all, uh, the supremum of, of all, all uh, any pair of distance between the set and F, okay? It's the supremum. So it's basically the, the diameter of the set. So the diameter goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Then we have its intersection has exactly one point. So this is equivalent of saying that a metric space is complete. And we know that C is complete. Okay? So this Rn is Rn is complete. Okay, this is in Walter Rudin's uh is one of the Walter Rudin's uh theorem. Okay, so I just skip it. Okay, the proof for this direction. So we want to show that it's complete, and wanna we want to see something like this. Okay, let's just pick. For any n, we'll pick we'll pick an element. Then if we have this, then we have this, right? Because. Well, because they are nested, they are nested, right? And we know that their distance is less than the diameter. Right. By the definition of diameter. Now, for each epsilon over n zero, we pick a capital N such that the diameter is less than epsilon, because we know that the diameter goes to zero. Okay. Now, what we have now is that x n is Cauchy. Right. By our construction of this, we know that x n is Cauchy, so we can it's complete. Then we can have a limit. Now, because xn is an fn for all n greater than n, and we know that for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists n such that xn is in the epsilon ball of x naught because it converges to x naught, right? So we first we fix a capital N. Then we know that there exists n such that we know that n is greater than equal to n, and we have this, which means that it does. The intersection is not empty, which means that you're in the closure. Because for any f over zero, we got this is not empty. So x zero is in the closure, which is equal to fn. Right? So here. Now if we have another point, then their distance is less than diameter n, and this goes to zero, which gives that y is equal to x n x naught. Okay, so for this direction. First, we show that the diameter a is equal to the closure of diameter a, and the, uh, the explanation is given here. So for this, this direction is trivial, okay? Now, for this direction, we pick two points in the closure. Then for any epsilon greater than zero, we know that there exist points in E such that P prime lies in the epsilon above P and Q prime lies in the epsilon above Q, which gives this, okay? Because they're in the closure. So we have triangle inequality. Okay, we have triangle inequality here. And each of them are less than 2 epsilon. And this is again by less than diameter of uh, E. Okay, now which gives that this is an upper bound of all PQ and the closure. Right, then we have this equality, uh, inequality. And we just let E goes to zero, right? 
Okay, so now we let x in be a Cauchy sequence, and we want to show that x n converges. We define x n to the closure of this, so p greater than or equal to n. So all the tails start from n. f n is like a tail after n, okay? And it's the closure of this. Then it is nested, obviously. Now, for epsilon greater than zero, we can pick an n such that this, we have this, because x n is Cauchy, right? We're using Cauchy condition. Now, for this, we know that the diameter of fn is the diameter of this sequence, right? We just take off the just take off the horizontal line because we have this. Now we have this, right? Because for any mn greater than n, right? This is true. Then we know this inequality holds for all n greater than capital N. Right? Which means that this goes to zero. Well, by our hypothesis, right, we're going this direction, then we just pick a point in it. Now for any n, we know that we have this is this uh, inequality, right? By definition. Now, which means that this goes to x naught because this goes to zero. Okay, so this is a Cantor's theorem, Condor's theorem. All right, so now let's we'll start our class. A path of gamma in the region is a continuous function, okay? And gamma maps from interval to G. If its derivative is continuous, then we say gamma is a smooth path. If there exists a partition such that it is continuous on each subinterval, then it's called piecewise smooth. And now we have another definition. So a gamma function is is of bounded variation if there exists a constant such that for any partition, any partition, partition of AB, we have this, which is this sum is less than n. So so just observe, take a look at this sum, okay? And the total variation is defined to be the supremum of all this sum. It's defined as supremum of all p in the partition of AB. And obviously we have, this is true because, right? M, M is the upper bound for, M is the upper bound. And this is the supremum, so supremum and M is finite, okay? So here's a proposition. Gamma is bounded variation if and only if the real and imaginary of gamma are bounded variation. So for this direction, we use this inequality. Right? Yeah, this is true. And for this direction, we pick we pick a bound for the real and imaginary parts. Now, for any partition, this sum is equal to this is sum, right? Because this is really just this. The difference of reals like those, okay? I'm just abbreviating some abbreviations. And each of them are bounded, right? So it's just this. But this is a finite sum, so it's so it's bounded, so we're we're good. Another prop uh, proposition is that if V is non decreasing or is increasing, then it is automatically a bounded variation, and we have this, okay? So the total variation is just the difference. So the proof is kind of easy. So for any partition, we can telescope, right? We can take off the absolute sign because it is this, and we've got a telescoping, and this is equal to this. All right, so let's do for some proposition. 1.2 says that, okay, if you're bounded variation, then p car partition such that p is the subset of q, then the partition is less than the partition of q. So which means that as, as the partition gets finer, this sum is getting smaller. Okay? So... Part A. So we just let q be... Let's just just q have one more 
point. Then P. And, and we use the triangle inequality. Right? Because if you have one more point, then this is it, is our extra point. And we have this. Right? So we have this inequality, then we're done. Okay? So if you have k more points, you just repeat this process k times. And for part b, is that okay? If you're also bound to variation, and these two are complex numbers, so if, if sigma is also bound to variation, and we have two complex numbers, then this sum is bound to variation, and we have this inequality, okay? So, uh, let's just write out the sum. Tk plus beta sigma Tk minus uh, alpha of gamma of t k minus one plus beta of sigma of sigma of t k minus one, right? So we want to estimate this. We just use triangle inequality. It's just less than alpha of So taking some, then we see that it's bounded. It's bounded, right? And we know that alpha plus this plus beta of the total variance sigma is an is upper bound. Is an upper bound of of um of this p right for all partition and the partition of right so this proves our claim right because this is upper bound then this is upper bound then you're greater than equal to the supreme left to the reader and approved it. Okay? So now we have another proposition is that if you're piecewise smooth and you're bound to variation and we have this. So piecewise smooth then we give bound to variation and we have this equality. So the total variation is just the integral of so this is a real valued function, right? Because we're taking into V and we're taking absolute values. So we again get a real number. So this is a real integral. Okay? So let's just um, assume assume um, gamma is smooth and piecewise. Easily. Okay, so if we if we sh first show that is, so if we prove that oh if if it's just smooth, then if it's piecewise smooth, then we can use the fact that the supremum of set A plus B is the supremum of A plus the supremum of B. If A, B, all elements are non-negative. If, ne if the elements and set A, B are non-negative, then the supremum has the linear property. Okay, so this is for this. And we know that for integrals, we know that A, C, C, B is just A, B, right? For real integrals, right? Then if it's just piecewise smooth, then we discuss each piece 
we discuss each piece and then we add them up and then we add them up okay so just just first assume that it's globally smooth so we let p be a partition okay give a partition estimating now is equal to the sum of from 1 m m of gamma of pk minus this is our just definition okay no let's just keep evaluating Because it is smooth. Smooth means that its derivative is continuous. Well, if your derivative is continuous, then you're in the global. Right? So it's really just right? By a fundamental theorem, by fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Now this is less than equal to the integral of the absolute values, right? Now we have our right. We're using results from real integrals, right? Telescoping, right? All right. So, so now we have this is the upper bound of all partition, which gives that v of gamma. Or this is a terrible gamma. V of gamma is less than or equal to this, right? All right. Now for other direction. For other direction. Since we know that it is smooth and we're at the final compact set, right? Then it's uniformly continuous. Which means that we can pick delta one such that this gives So we're using the condition of being uniformly continuous. Now we can pick another delta. Now this delta delta is that if the mesh, so the mesh is like the the longest maximum of t k minus t k minus one. Okay, so k what from from n one. Okay, so is the maximum length. If the mesh is less than delta 2, we have this is a result from real Stelgis integral. Okay, this is a result from real Stelgis integral. Of So value this thing less than epsilon for any tau is n all right for any tau tau k all right so we're we're just using that as in the global all right so with that being said hence we have what the integral a b so we're just breaking this inequality we're just breaking this inequality up uh, we have this is less than what epsilon plus the sum okay it's just epsilon plus now for each of those
飲みですかってですね Estimation here. Okay, so this observe that this is really just. Oh, sorry. So this thing, we can change it to. So we can just view this as a constant function, okay? So constant function and grading with respect to this. So the reason we're doing this thing is that, well, we can perform some estimation, right? And grow of. Okay, so let me just move this away more. So what we're really doing is that for this thing above, we're subtracting tau t. Uh, no, no, no. So for this thing above, we're subtracting this and plus t. Since we're integrating with respect to dt, right? So we do this, and then we split the absolute value sign. So it's less than equal to sum of the integral of Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the estimation should be should be this. I'm just looking at my notes. Okay, so the estimation should be this. Okay, cause yeah, and we break it apart. It's just integral of tau k t dt this plus the sum of t dt okay so we're just splitting it okay so after we split this what we have now is that okay we're splitting this now if the mesh less than delta which is picking as the minimum of minimum for the minimum then we know that okay if we're less than this then we know that each each tau prime t tau, tau k is in a difference of t less than epsilon for t in this Right, we have this, and we know that then we go back to our estimation. We go back to our estimation, right? So we have this, we're estimating this, right? Now, using this, if we pick mesh like this, then this whole thing is just epsilon, right? I'm sorry. less than okay so the thing inside is just um, epsilon dt right so the integral of epsilon dt right then we use telescoping is really just epsilon of b minus a okay and plus this thing okay now epsilon plus epsilon of 1 plus b minus a plus each of them is again 
right? Each of them will use fundamental theorem of algebra. Oh, I'm sorry, fund fund each of them will use fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Then we have this is really, we break up into, we're going back to gamma p, right? We're going back to here. We're going back. And we, our estimation again, I'll just e times some constant, right? This is a constant plus d suprema. And I'll just let e go to zero, right? Then we have this less than equal to this, and we're done. We're done. Okay? As I said, if it's piecewise, we just consider each piece as a whole. Whole, piece, uh, whole thing okay so the next is that so the next theorem it's a big theorem is is that oh if your bounded variation is suppose that this f is continuous then there exists a complex number i such that for any epsilon there's a delta such that when the mesh when the mesh is less than delta then we have this inequality for any tau k chosen in the ball, right? For any tau k. And this i is called a Riemann Stouger's integral of f with respect to gamma over a b. Okay? So they're complex valued. And this i is denoted as f d gamma or ft d gamma t. But in the short term, we just write ft gamma. Okay? So, because this t is the meaningless symbol. Okay? So this i is the integral which means that if you are bounded and you're continuous then the integral exists okay all right so this theorem involves uh cantor's theorem we're going to use cantor's theorem so let's see how it goes so first you're continuous on a compact set so you're uniformly continuous Okay, we're gonna use this later. So first we pick delta one greater than delta two. So inductively chosen such that when S and T are delta M closed, we have them are one over M close. Okay, we one over M close. Which is this is possible because it's uniformly continuous. Now we define. Okay, now we define to be the set of all p in a partition of A B such that the mesh of p is less than delta m. Okay. Now. Then we know that P1 contains P2, contains P3, it is a nested set, okay? We know this, okay? We, we, we know this as by our construction, right? By our construction. Now we define Fm to be the set of all sum tau k gamma of t k minus t uh, so the all sum of such form okay so k goes to 1 to n such that we have p is in this set so fm is to find the sum of all such sum where the n its partition is in Pn, okay? And as usual, tau k is in the subintegral. Okay? It's time to find to be the set, it's to find to be a closure of this set. Okay, it's to find to be the closure of this set. So here are its claim. Claim is that okay? F one, 
both f is a nested sequence of set, and the diameter of each fm is less than or equal to some two, is some function of m. Okay. So this is our claim. Okay. So this is our claim. Now, if we if we done if we if we prove so let's just assume that after we prove the claim if we pr prove the claim by camper's theorem by camper's theorem there exists a unique i in all of them, right? Because they are nested, they are closed. This is defined with some closure of the set, so of course it's closed, and its diameter goes to zero, right? This is some constant, and we're dividing by m. So it is nested, it goes to zero, diameter goes to zero, it's a closed set. Then, by Gauss theorem, we have, because C is complete, okay? So we have this unique element in here. So after we have this, after we have this, what can we say? Then it means that, then for epsilon grand zero, just let m be greater than two epsilon of this, where m is a natural number. Okay, by well, this is possible by Archimedean property. I just don't spend time discussing about this now. Then we rearrange this, we rearrange this, gives that f is greater than 2mv gamma, and this is greater than or equal to the diameter of fm by our claim. Okay, and Because we know that I is an Fn, then Fn is in the epsilon ball of centered at I. Okay, this is not really obvious uh, instantly, but it's kind of obvious if I explain here. Because for any element, we know that the Xi is less than equal to diameter of f m right and the diameter of m is less than epsilon right well this is really just this okay then for if we just pick delta equal to delta m then we're done why because so for any epsilon greater than zero, like there's a delta, it's delta equal to delta m for for p such that the mesh of p less than delta. Well, this is by our construction is really just saying that it's really just p is in this set, right? Now, for any elements in Fm, for any elements in Fm, right? Fm is to be defined to be a set of all such sum where the partition is in Pm. Now, if we pick an element, so Defined for any partition belongs to Pm, the corresponding element in Fm, which is the corresponding sum, right? The corresponding sum, we must have the sum and i are epsilon close, right? Because if, if the mesh is less than delta m, this m is taken such that. We have this, so we have
we have epsilon squared in a diameter of fn, right? Then we know that we're just repeating our argument here. Right, so any element in the sum, which means that element here, anything here, this thing, and i, they are epsilon close. Right, since we have Fm is the subset of this. Right, then we're done. Because for any epsilon, we have a delta such that for any mesh less than delta, we have this inequality for any tau k in a subinterval. For the mesh less than delta, We have for any partition this, this corresponding fm. The corresponding fm, we have the diameter is less than epsilon. Well, if the diameter is less than epsilon, then we have this. Okay, so this is really what our theorem says, right? So now just prove the claim. Let's just prove the claim. Prove the claim. And now f each f is nested. Since each p are nested. Right? Let's just look at the definition of f. Right? Because P is nested and F and R are also nested. So does leg, right? And to show to show diameter, the inequality for diameter less than two M V gamma, we use we use the fact that diameter A is equal to the diameter of closure. And the closure. Now for for P a partition, okay. Define S P is the sum of all form in sum of all form of this. We want to show that if P is in this set and you have a Q containing P, then we have they are 1 over M this close. So for this, we just consider Q has one extra point then compare to compare to p and we perform our we just perform the direct computation okay we so we here we finally use that of tau minus f of sigma here we're going to use our uniform continu continu continuity right for continuous uh, statement this gives the inequality okay so it's kind of it's kind of tedious so I just skip it if you like just direct computation if you consider one extra point so what can you say about this sum? okay you can just separate them right and then each of them you have this right because you're subtracting then you have something in front of this right then we're, we're, we're good now, we let P and R and this set, we 
an IQ to find their common refinement, the union. Okay. We have less than or equal to P and R. we have this so this is we use it twice right so what this says each of those are elements in F so the diameter is less than equal to this so we, we prove the claim okay which completes the proof and the proposition of so like here is the here is the computation which I skipped. Okay, so it's kind of tedious. And proposition one point seven is trivial. Okay, so let G be are continuous and they're bound to variation. Different complex scalars alpha and beta. We have these two inequalities, and I have done. I mean, I I finished it so. You can also finish it, okay? And for 1.8, we have a bounded variation and we have a continuous function. Now if we have partition, then we can integral it, we can integrate it like piecewise integrate. You can integrate them piecewise. So the entire integral is, you can integrate them piecewise. So this is true for a real integral, but here we're talking about complex value integrals, okay? So it still holds. So how do we prove it? We use induction. Okay. We use induction. Base case is when m is equal to zero. Uh, I mean one, sorry. It's one. So if we're given a trivial partition, which is a is equal to t zero and t one is equal to b, where n is equal to one. For sake of, for sake of, not being confusing. So t is one is equal to b. Okay, so trivial partition. Then, this is really just trivial. Now, suppose n is k is true, we'll consider n is k plus 1. So here is my logic. Suppose that, okay, you have k plus 1 points, okay? Now, if you delete it, then by inductive hypothesis, this holds, right? Then we know that, okay, this integral, then we know that this AB is just this, 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 sum of this, right? And this is inductive hypothesis. But if we can show that, if we can just show that, well, if we can just show that, okay, let's say alpha, beta, t. If we can show that um, this is alpha, t, t, beta, right? If we can show something like this, then the last term of this sum can be breaking apart. Can be breaking apart like this. So it can be breaking apart like this. Then it's really just this say this is to n right one to n then this is equal to one n minus one of this plus this plus this right now we put these two terms back into the summation which is just one 
n plus 1 of those, right, those, those intervals, okay? I mean the summation of an integral with respect to the intervals. So, to prove the inductive hypothesis, we just need to show this, this is true, okay? So let us consider this case. Now, hmm, the proof is, okay, let me just move, it, move this thing over here. So, to prove this, let's just start. Um, we know that AT and TB, they exist, right? We know that they exist because F is continuous. We can pick delta prime such that this minus f of tau k uh, something blah 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 is less than f over 2. And we can pick delta prime such that t to b minus less than f over 2 because we're given that these two exist. Okay, now we pick is the minimum of if we pick their minimum and we consider this this sum. Minus so this is sum over a and t. This is sum over t to b. Okay, then this sum over a to b. Okay, so we're doing this. I mean, for any partition having mesh less than delta, okay, just skip that. It's not important. And here we have tau k, gamma, blah, 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 right? This. So this sum for a b, right? We can split it into a t and t b, and after we split it, we have triangle inequality, right? Right? Well, this means that this means that by our definition, right, this is really just our integral. Then we know that this thing, then we know that this thing is equal to Because this is uniquely de uh, uniquely defined, so we have to equal to each other. Okay, so we can different. I mean, not different. We can we can integrate them piecewisely. Integrate them piecewise. Okay. So the next proposition says that okay, we have a formula. This looks really like the change of variables theorem, right? If it's piecewise smooth and it's continuous, then we have this formula. Okay. So theorem one point nine is going to be our last theorem. Gotta sleep, bro. Uh, Eight thirty classes tomorrow. Okay, so we consider if gamma is just smooth, we just consider it smooth, okay? Because well, if it's piecewise smooth, we break each piece. We break it into pieces and we can add them up. Okay, so this is left as an exercise for you guys. And I I thought about it. It's it's really just using our proven results. It's just using our, you know, just it's not really hard. Okay, you just 
argue it. So first, we'll just consider and consider, consider this. And we have the gamma of the image sense is the real rounding function. We first consider this, so I'll explain why. Okay, so we just first, first consider this real value. Now we just let the square zero. We pick this such that this gives gives you the sum. Of, so we estimate this. This is true, and we also have well. Why can we pick make such choice? Because gamma prime is gamma is smooth, which means that gamma prime is continuous, and f is also continuous. So the product of continuous function is also continuous, and and this t so. Uh, this t is like sigma t equals to t. It is what it is non-decreasing, so it is a bounded variation. So if you're given continuous complex value function and a bounded variation, then we have the integral is defined. Okay. And let's just keep going. This thing also less than f number two. Okay, so here, because those tau are arbitrarily chosen, and remember, gamma is real valued. So for real value function, when we talk about derivatives, and here we have this and this. If we this divided by this is equal to this, what is well is mean value theorem? Don't you see that? It's mean value theorem. So we just pick tau k, pick tau k such that we have mean value theorem, blah blah blah. Right? Well this turns out that so we pick a tau k such that this tau this tau k is equal to this divided by this. And so this tau k is chosen for here. And we let a tau k here to be the same as the tau k here. So then we can just cancel them out. Okay? Then we have this subtract this so this will cancel out and we use triangle inequality right less than equal to this plus this which is epsilon 2 plus epsilon 2 so less than epsilon or less than less than equal to it doesn't matter but as long as we can let epsilon go to zero we're done right so now in general In general, so if gamma is a complex value, then we know that a b of f d gamma is b of f of d of real gamma plus i imaginary gamma. Okay, so above there's a trivial exercise. Not quite trivial, but not hard. Where is it? Here. Um, here. Right, we can split them for any complex scalars alpha and beta. 
right? We can split them. Now, first we have, okay, gamma is bounded variation if and only if each of them are bounded variation. So these two are also bounded variation, okay? And with that being said, we can split them, which is just f d real plus i times f d imaginary gamma. Okay. Now we have our result for for real value functions. This is integral of f of now we have so these two are so this is so these two say they are um f and g okay then we know that f so one f plus i g is f plus i g right which is this plus i this which is f real gamma prime plus i of f imaginary gamma prime dt which is f of real gamma prime plus i imaginary gamma prime and remember how we defined the derivative right we're just breaking it bre breaking imaginary parts and each steps are well explained okay they're just fine wow exactly six pages all right so that's the end for today's lecture. See you guys next time.